So, would you like to say a few words sure. from our sponsor? <laughs> well, our hosts, who very kindly provided the venue and the drinks. Um, Thank you. Take, take the floor. Thank you. Sorry, let me. Uh, yeah. So my commitment to you is that I will be the, the shortest speaker tonight. And I will also probably say the, the stuff that's of least interest to you, but I'm going to do it anyway. So thank you and welcome for coming. Um, and <clears throat> I just wanted to say a few words about Critical Blue. I make a general assumption um, as I travel the world that people don't know anything about Critical Blue. So um, I'll put that right. Um, so Critical Blue, we have a long history in um, obscure, doing obscure things with uh, binary level dynamic analysis of software, which usually puts people to sleep. Um, but most recently, we've been focusing on uh, mobile platforms and in using some interesting new techniques to be able to identify, do software authentication to identify mobile apps in the wild. So. What that means is that the ability for a, a server who's interfacing with uh, mobile devices and mobile apps to know for sure that the traffic that it's seeing is actually coming from the mobile app that they, that they think it's coming from and that the mobile app has not been tampered with in any way. And that's a, a major step forward. I, will bore, I won't bore you with all the reasons, all the ways in which people try to do this today, but it is a, a major way forward. We do it in a way that doesn't require any embedded st static secret that can be extracted out of the mobile app. So it's, it's very clever, it's, uh, it's deployed, we have real customers using it, it's all good stuff. What we're now looking at is how we migrate this into the, into the world of IoT. And today, um, two of our very smart and much more interesting presenters than me will talk about um, what, we're, what we're thinking about doing. So one of the things that we'd love to get is lots of feedback from you guys as to what you think about what we're doing and where you think the kinds of uh, ideas we've got could be applied. And with that, enough. Thank you very much. Thanks, Simon. So, um, as Simon mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, the Google Analytics of Things. Um, so, um, uh, just out of interest, are, are any of you using Google Analytics with IoT devices right now? No? That's it. Okay. So, hopefully, this won't put you to, to sleep, Simon, but um, perhaps you'll, you'll learn something. <laughs> so, um, my name's Martin Hoxie, and my day job is actually at uh, a membership organization called the Association for Learning Technology. So this has nothing to do with my day job. I, put, you, I put up my business card anyway, which is, this is actual size, just to fit the job title in. We're quite a small organization, so I end up doing quite a lot of the jobs in there. Um, in my, as part of what I do uh, in, in the day job, um, it kind of, it links into some, I was very fortunate a couple of years ago um, to start using a product called Google Apps Script. And because um, no one uses this product, uh, Google actually corralled me into a, a very uh, special group of Google developer experts. So if you're using uh, Google products uh, and you're um, quite good at that, uh, there's an opportunity to come together with other experts not employed by Google and learn more. So as part of that program, um, I started had an opportunity to speak to Google Analytics experts, and there's uh, a couple of them here. Um, interestingly, Google have just um, extended the program to IoT. So if you're doing stuff with Google products um, in IoT, and you'd like to be 
become a, a Google expert in, the, in this area, then um, have a word with me afterwards. So a lot of this presentation is actually based on the work um, a guy called uh, Nico Michelli's done. So Nico's based in uh, Philadelphia in the States. And he's really explored what, what you can do with um, Google Analytics beyond uh, the, the kind of simple uh, web page tracking. Um, so all these people are very contactable, so, uh, and they are the real experts in this. So uh, if you want to uh, follow up on any of these things, I'm more than happy to put you in touch with them. So um, in this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to very quickly just introduce you, hopefully you already know a lot about um, Google Analytics within web tracking, but then we're going to go into what's actually further possible beyond that. Um, so, you know, in the beginning, it was all very simple. Uh, you know, when we had HTTP and markup, there wasn't really much interest in, in doing anything beyond, you know, measuring what was happening, what pages were being viewed, and what links were being clicked upon. But since then, you know, a lot of, a lot of really cool frameworks have come out that just completely changed the web experience into a, a full-blown web application. Uh, in terms of tracking this, you know, uh, Google Analytics has evolved um, as part of that. So uh, I'm sure, are, are many of you web developers in your spare time? Yeah, and many of you using Google Analytics to get some data back? So you know about, you know, hooking into events on the page, you know, dynamic loading of content, buttons, and so on. Um, as tracking's got, uh, as web development's got more advanced, um, so is Google Analytics. So um, a lot of people, when they think about Google Analytics, they think of it as just a way of uh, analyzing web pages. But it actually goes beyond that. Um, there's a lot you can do in understanding engagement. So, um, and there's obviously lots of other products uh, that are out there that uh, do that. One person, so good. I get another talk where I've got uh, a room of people to educate and entertain. Um, what the Google Analytics measurement protocol does is it removes the requirement for JavaScript altogether. Um, and it basically provides a very basic API for you to start sending data into Google Analytics. Um, so uh, all you need to do is make a HTTP request to uh, the Google Analytics measurement protocol. Um, so this can be get or post. Um, so, you know, there's all, you know, the majority of programming tools that you're already working with will make some a request like that into there. This opens it up. So, you know, it's no longer just web applications. It's the whole gambit. You know, you can do this on smart TVs, kiosks, anything that has an internet connection um, can potentially be sending data into Google Analytics. And there's a couple of things uh, I think worth highlighting about this that um, can actually take this concept even further. So uh, looking at some of the possibilities, so um, this was something that uh, Nico Michelli, who's one of the Google Analytics uh, experts put together. So he's just got a, a Raspberry Pi, uh, a couple of sensors on that. Um, so he's, he's tried things with motion sensors, with light sensors. Um, so very basic kit. And what you can actually do is, uh, with a couple lines of code, uh, this is Python code, you can actually send, uh, uh, this is an example of a motion sensor. You probably might not be able to see it in detail. But uh, 
essentially with um, uh, you know a couple lines of code, all we're doing is making a URL request and sending data into Google Analytics. In this uh, example, all he's doing is whenever the motion sensor is detecting movement, it's sending a hit into Google Analytics. So that comes with some useful features. So uh, you know you don't have to worry about creating uh, dashboards to, to quickly look at this data. Um, you can use the built-in thing. So uh, here's the example uh, Nico did of um, using his motion sensor to actually detecting his uh, sleep patterns. Um, obviously, there are lots of other ways that you could solve this problem. Um, so let's see how we can actually take it a bit further to make it uh, a bit more uh, practical. So um, obviously, with your internet of thing device, it might not always be on the internet. You don't want to constantly be calling up Wi-Fi. So you might want it to, to be uh, uh, offline, uh, working away in the background for a bit, and then come along online every uh, couple of hours or so. So what the measurement protocol has within its uh, specification is something called queue time. So basically, you can have your device sleeping for four hours, and then when it wakes up as part of another process, you can start actually pushing data into the, the Google Analytics with a queue time, which gives you an offset. So even though you've come back online four hours later, you can actually give reliable timings of when events have actually happened. The other uh, thing you have is batch. So you might have had a number of events happening in that four hour period. What the Google Analytics measurement protocol allows you to do is actually send batches of data. So uh, it's limited to 20 um, hits, um, but you know you can hit the, the batch protocol uh, a mul multiple number of times. So it, you know, it might take you a while if you've got a big queue of data to get through it. Um, but um, you know, it, it's another way of approaching the problem uh, and potentially getting information off your device uh, into Google Analytics. Um, so looking at crossing the divide, so. If you've done stuff with Google Analytics before, um, one of the things that you may have spotted within the terms of service is you can't actually send anything that's identifiable to a user into the Google Analytics um, uh, data. So things like names or email addresses, not allowed. And if you're caught doing that, you potentially get your account uh, killed. What Google Analytics does, however, provide is within the um, both the web um, version of <coughs> Google Analytics, so the Universal Analytics, but the measurement protocol as well, is the ability to send in a user ID. So um, this can be a hash of an email address. So it can be something that you've already got uh, logged within your system. The really interesting thing about this is you can actually use client IDs across web to your device and so forth. So if you're starting an interaction with a user using uh, a web, um, um, interface to initialize an IoT device or, or interact with it, you can actually send in the same uh, user ID into that data, and that gets aggregated within the Google Analytics reporting. So you can see flows of a user going from the web to, to how they're interacting with your device and wherever they go after that, as long as you're, you're using um, either the Google Analytics measurement protocol or the web tracking. Um, so the other thing to just note on here, you might not be able to see, is when you're using uh, uh, Google Analytics, is um, you have a, a tracking ID. And the tracking ID you use on your, your web uh, uh, sites is exactly the same as the tracking ID you use in the measurement protocol. So again, we're getting continuity of data across uh, platforms and devices. So um, let's have a look at uh, a couple of other examples of how you might be able to do this. So um, this is an example of um, a friend of mine who's uh, published a number of different libraries. And actually, he uses uh, Google Analytics to check when people upgrade their library to the, to the latest version. Um, so you know, he's just using standard Google Analytics reporting to see uh, when something happens. So uh, in this particular case, one of his previous versions of his libraries was going to break, break. So he needed to move everyone onto the new library. And he could actually monitor whether that, that was happening. 
with an IoT and security, it might be the fact that you want to send data back about if your device has been attacked. Um, again, you could log uh, connections to your device that are uh, trying to probe it for uh, weaknesses, uh, and you can get that back into Google Analytics. Within the, if you've played around with the Google Analytics reporting, you also get real-time reporting. So again, with the measurement protocol, you can see all this happening in real time as well. So um, within uh, the measurement protocol and uh, web uh, tracking, there's lots of different hit types you can use. So it's not just pages or events. Um, you can go into um, e-commerce sides of things. Um, it'll also do exception tracking. So if you, you're trying to log errors in your script um, or errors within your device, um, there's actually a dedicated hit type that you can use. So within Google Analytics, obviously it's not going to be the solution for everything. Um, you're still constrained by what you can send back in terms of hit type data. Um, but it's not always just sending back one hit. So you can send back uh, integers you know, if you've got multiple hits. Or for commerce, if you've got multiple values, um, that can be included in your data. Um, I've mentioned a couple of times the, the inbuilt reporting. Uh, if you haven't looked at Google Analytics recently, there's uh, an ever-growing uh, palette of tools that you can use. So you can actually get some, uh, I think, very useful event flow uh, funnel information that you can actually use to, to look at how people are interacting with your devices, how they're using your devices. Uh, really, it's trying to get some sort of actionable insight from the data that you're collecting so that you can improve what you're doing. Within uh, Google Analytics, there, there are actually APIs for reporting as well. So you don't have to be restricted by what Google presents you as a, a, a dashboard. Um, so uh, this allows you to do more automated stuff in terms of, of reporting what's going on. Uh, uh, allows you to customize the, the way that you're presenting that data. And you might want to connect that data with other uh, sources. So for example, when I mentioned that you can get the user ID and the client ID, uh, there's an opportunity to get that data back out of Google Analytics and actually match it with a person. Because uh, whilst you've sent anomalized data in, in terms of, uh, or semi-anomalous data in, uh, there's, once you've got that data back out through reporting, you can uh, do a lookup. Um, and there's lots of, uh, I think, increasingly easy ways to start uh, creating your own custom reports. So, Within Google Sheets, there's a, an add-on now for uh, Google Analytics. So it's a really quick way of just creating very simple reports that for the, um, the dimensions and metrics that you're interested in. Uh, this was a, an example I produced of um, a script that you can configure to uh, grab data out of um, Google Analytics and actually send it off as emails and CSVs and other formats. Uh, Google Analytics. Analytics also has a, a product called Super Proxy, um, which allows you to do something similar. So again, it allows you to uh, distribute data to people that might not necessarily have, you want to have access uh, to your, your Google Analytics reporting by the website. And something else that's come out recently is um, Google have a, a, a data studio. Um, so again, this allows you to integrate with uh, Google Analytics and other data sources and start building up uh, pictures of what's going on. Um, so that was kind of a, a whistle-stop tour of what's possible within uh, Google Analytics and, and the measurement protocol. Um, so hopefully it's inspired you to go off and have a look at what's possible in the documentation. Uh, and now that you know, you know what, what, is, uh, what is potential, what is possible, um, hopefully you can get creative and have some fun and slide down the stairs. <laughs> Yeah. 
my experience now, there's no such thing. One way or another, data can be joined up somewhere. So, even on an anonymized device, devices, um, how would you get user consent for tracking data? Yeah. There's nothing in Google Analytics to stop it being joined up down the line. And I think it's really up to developers to, to make that uh, an option. So obviously with the, the web tracking, you know, you can use things, ad blockers that prevent you from having your data collected into Google Analytics. With the measurement protocol, there's nothing stopping that. So I think it's very much up to how you're defining, designing your devices and providing that opportunity for people to consent to actually allowing data to be collected. Uh, and I think the important thing is it's, as far as possible, informed consent, because uh, you know, quite often we get these screeds and screeds of terms and conditions which no one reads, but I think, you know, uh, I think in terms of be best practice, it's putting something like that to the very top, the very simple button, do you want us to allow tracking or not, and a, a choice between buttons. But I think it's a very good point. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. 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 No. Um. <laughs> Uh, within IoT, I, d I don't know what they're getting from it. With web, uh, you know, oh, yeah. it's you know it's ads. Uh, well, it's a very good question, and uh, I don't think I have an answer to that. Um, but increasingly, I'm seeing you know, uh, you know, the bar being you know, uh, within Google Analytics. There, there is a premium service which allows you to send more volume of data and into Google Analytics. Um, and, you know, I increasingly see the threshold between the free becoming bigger and the premium smaller. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I increasingly I think they want more and more data and they want to remove the hurdle uh, <laughs> even more to get it. Hope so. So I think um, if there are any other, maybe time for one more question before we go on to Barry. One quick one. So, so you said that Google will put your family, your professional information in it. But why is it acceptable then to include, or essentially, it's personal information like the user ID? So yeah. You know, you're, you're only yeah. Way of identifying. Uh, I, I believe this is down to the Data Protection Act. Um, because it's not sending, uh, you know, names and addresses, they get around data protection legislation. So the paper is Google looking after their own bag rather than... Yeah, yeah. yeah. They don't want to be a data controller. Can I add to that? Because there's another thing called GDPR. <laughs> 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 um, 
<laughs> oh, yes. Uh, huge numbers of very important people do not understand mm. this in force. For those of you who still think it's coming into force next year, uh, look at Article 99. It's, it's in force now as individuals and businesses. We all have the right to say, no, you, you cannot use that yeah. unnamed. And I think that includes things like profiling, am I right? Yeah, well, profiling, profiling is a very interesting concept, mm. um, which judges are having meetings about mm. uh, now to try and learn yeah. what it really means. But it's fundamental that you can put entities, data entities of any size or type together in one way or another that eventually arrives at being connected with an individual, a data user. Yeah. So, um, yeah, let's configure the next deck. Uh, why not another round of applause? <laughs> Yeah, it's more sort of general. Yeah. 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 And also I get Richard's audience then as well, you see. And dirty, uh, yeah. That's right, that's working. So, good night. Yeah. Slide it over. Right, yeah, you need to grab the top of it. There you go. There you go. Get the other one. Um, yeah, follow yeah. us on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Perfect. Alright. Check it out. Um, Wi-Fi, I'm sure there's Wi-Fi. Do you guys have data? I need to my Apple reconnect. Yeah. <laughs> Are you able to walk around the podcast or not? Yeah, yeah. 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 I can't remember the password. Yeah. Best sort of password. Yeah. No one knows it. Super safe. If, if, it's, mm. if it's a problem, yeah. we'll just dodge the question and, and, and move on rapidly. Right, yeah. over to you. Okay, thanks. <coughs> so um, what I'm going to do is very quickly introduce um, this idea of threat modeling. Um, has anyone heard of threat modeling as a security approach? Yeah. So um, very, very useful when you're at the kind of the design stage of your project. Um, I would argue actually completely vital at the design stage of your project. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of problems further down the road. So um, well, there's very, very sort of high level introduction to what it is, how you might go about doing it and what the benefits are and what help there is out there 
to try and um, um, you know, help you along the way. And what can be quite a large subject, but doesn't need to be. So um, sort of set the scene a little bit. Just so far this year, already IoT um, problems have been in the news, many different things. So the uh, most recent one just last week was these meal dishwashers. Um, internet to dishwasher, why not? Um, shouldn't be a big deal, but these are in hospitals. Um, so if you can compromise this, you have control over the settings, so temperature. So if that's an award where you're doing infection control, suddenly you're not getting hot plates, and that's bad. Um, more importantly, though, is once you're inside the network, if this thing's connected to an external network, you get inside the network, then you can start looking around for other things which are more interesting. Enter drug cabinet. So computer connected, hooked up to the, in theory, just the hospital intranet. So you're able to have prescriptions put in, you put in the patient ID, and it dispenses the drugs that patient needs to have at that particular time. All very good. 1,400 flaws currently in the in circulation version of this. Mainly because they didn't design an upgrade path for the Windows version. It runs Windows Server 2003. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's not going to get fixed. And the only way to fix it is for hospitals to buy a new one for many, 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 many hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, what I particularly like is cloud pets. You can send messages to each other and you know, talk to your children through it, and it's all lovely and things. Unfortunately, they use an out-of-date, unsecured MongoDB database in the back end. So um, that's been cracked wide open and exfiltrated lots and lots of email addresses of people and video and telephone conversations with their children and all these sort of things. So big privacy problem with that one. Um, and then another similar classic classic um, consumer problem is uh, um, internet connected webcams. Just a horrendously bad idea. These things are such mass market now that the bottom line is so, so difficult to reach that every corner is being cut and the speed of trying to get new stuff to market is incredible. So the pressure on these guys is immense. So they're just entirely features, get out of the door, make sure it's got the functionality that you want. And um, these are, you know, Rich Troll, for examples of exactly the things that can go wrong if you don't take security and do the threat analysis in advance. And, and in fact, if you look at um, what we'll look at is this top, you know, top list of classic exploits that you see in different types of devices. Um, these cameras tend to be full of them. Not just cameras, but also the internet um, web-based admin portals for them as well. It's truly horrendous. So the general reaction is when you start hearing all these stories is like, oh my God, these people, I'm smarter than these people. I would not make these mad mistakes. I remember these things are all designed by really smart people, you know, really clever ones, uh, many of whom have PhDs and stuff, and they still make these mistakes. Problem is, is the pressures um, you know, outside of just the direct engineering is there. You've got to get to market. You've got to have these features. We don't care it's well tested. We don't care if it's all up to date. Um, there's no money to do the maintenance patches and releases later on. You don't have a program for doing that. You don't have money for the servers in the cloud to distribute patches, all these sort of things. So um, even with the best intentions, you can very, very easily make mistakes. So the trick is, is to make sure that any security design you do up front is effective um, and rapid and um, as cheap as possible to save you trouble in the long run. Um, so as I was saying, it's very easy to get very technical about this. And Richard will get extremely technical in the next presentation. But um, what I want to do is to alert everyone who's more on the business side of things that they need to know this stuff, at least at the higher level, or at least know to ask the questions of the people who are designing these systems, that they need to be thinking about these sort of problems. Um, so in particular, um, once you have said, okay, guys, make sure you do a good security you know, job on this. I want to see you know, a threat analysis and you know, figure out who's going to attack us, how they might attack us, this sort of stuff. They're going to come back and say, well, it's going to cost lots of money or take lots of time to fix this problem and come up with a, you know, a fantastic authentication system, or we can drop the feature. Yeah? So you, you know, the, on the business side, you're going to start making these calls in terms of um, you know, the trade-off between time, money, and security. Um, also, our friend GDPR is there, of course. The um, thing I was surprised about is uh, Brexit's not going to save us. So there isn't even one good thing. Um, GDPR is, is beyond Europe, so any, any European citizens 
data which is held is under the jurisdiction of this. So, you know, Italy will come after you if you have Italian's data. Um, so, in particular, um, two articles um, pretty much mandate you have to do a security assessment up front and you have to have that documented. And if you don't, they'll rake you over the coals if there's, no, if there's an exploit against you. And um, secondly, you have to have a policy on, your, on privacy and how you're protecting people's data. So you have to have these built in from the beginning in your product and your system and your business. It has to all be there. All right, okay, so threat modeling is quite a massive subject. Um, we are only gonna focus on a very small amount of it. Um, so we'll quickly look at how to sort of think about the systems you're building. Um, mostly we'll talk about what can go wrong, because that's entertaining. And then um, a little bit about what you can do about these things overlap. We won't look at this very, very hard and important bit at the end. That's for future reading for anyone who's interested, um, is how you actually figure out whether you found all the things you didn't know were there. Good luck. Um, OK, so what are you building? If you don't have this sort of level of data flow diagram for your product and system, then you're not going to get very far at the beginning. You must have this on a whiteboard somewhere already when you're reading the design. So the main things you want are kind of the external factors that are in orange here. So whether it's a mobile phone app, um, a web interface, your devices, your sensor kind of neck, neck on the side. And also in particular the rules of the different types of um, user you want to have on the system. All the way up to kind of you know, the supervisory rules including yourself about what you can access and these sorts of things. Um, also you really want to pull out the sort of data in grey that you're storing. So where you're storing the data and potentially as you get down into more detail the sorts of data you're storing and particularly the reasons why. So all this stuff's good to start thinking about, about why am I keeping this, where am I keeping this, therefore what sort of security does it need. This is exactly the sort of stuff the GDPR is looking for. Um, and then each of the, orange, um, the sort of yellowy boxes, they're all about different processes and the data flows between them. Um, so this is where there's actually been a transform to the data or there's a service where it's you know, generating data or collating data and sending it back to you. One of the main reasons why you want to be able to draw these sort of diagrams of your system, as, as well as just being able to design the damn thing to start with, is um, the idea of trust boundaries. It's a very, very important concept because a trust boundary is where you, um, there's an assumption ab about the data once it goes across there, or the services you ask out there, only certain people can access that. And on the other side, there's a different set of people who can access the things on the other side of that trust boundary. Um, trust boundaries are basically where the attacks happen, more or less. That's where, or more accurately, that's where you need to defend against attacks. Um, there are two ways of thinking about it. Um, you want to do your defense on the trust boundary, but an attack might traverse the trust boundary and pop up somewhere else in a different component beyond that trust boundary. Because typically an attack is they put some bad data in and then along the range when it comes, you know, potentially it's going to go all the way and come all the way back out and you've got a cross-site scripting attack. So there's lots and lots of places where the actual attack can end up happening, but the defense point is your trust boundary. <clears throat> so there's sort of two ways you can draw these boundaries. Either it's fairly obvious in terms of the logical partitioning or the physical partitioning of your system. So it's a different machine, it's a different network, different subnet, separate processes, these sort of things. So it's kind of these natural boundaries happen. Um, or the other way, if you don't kind of know where they're going to be to start off with, if you're very early in your designs, you start thinking about the rules of people who are going to be interacting with the system starting from you know, the, highest, the highest level kind of root authority and you work backwards. And wherever there's going to be interaction with someone who has a lower level of authorization, then there's going to be a trust boundary happening there. So you have to identify that point and you have to protect that and make sure that nothing can leak across that boundary. Right, so once you've kind of identified your system um, and you know where the trust is going to flow, you know where the important things are kept, you can start thinking about how are people going to break into my system? What terrible things can happen? Um, there's lots of ways of thinking about this. Um, like the traditional one is just to brainstorm, um, which is quite effective actually, just throw ideas, what could go wrong. Usually that's influenced quite a lot by what you've heard in the news. Um, the another way of doing it, which is very popular, is to think like an attacker. And you just get your hoodie on and you think, ah, ha, 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 I'm going to break into this. That's really bad because, well, at least some of you are not hackers. So um, you'll end up with a very strange set of motivations based again largely on movies. So um, a good way of doing it is to one of these many, many mnemonics which kick around. So this particular one, Stride, is very straightforward and is quite effective. And just enumerating all the possible ways things could go wrong, applying that to your system, and then 
hopefully vulnerabilities start popping out and you can start addressing them very, very quickly. So um, first one, spoofing. Um, this is where you pretend, an attacker pretends to be something that they're not. Um, this is kind of the classic one and it can happen at all levels. So on the outside, the most obvious one is you're pretending to be someone else. So that could be a different user by stealing user credentials, could be a more elevated user, maybe stolen admin credentials. But also if someone's already got into the system and they create an, a new um, process on your system and make that pretend to be your process and therefore access the data that only your process should be able to access. Um, the same reverse as well, you can spoof a file so that you knock a configuration file out of the way, you load in a new configuration file, suddenly the system is you know, in debug mode and you can access everything. Or you get rid of the password's file, user's file, and inject your own, you've taken over. So there's lots of different ways that spoofing can affect your system in many different aspects. Um, tampering um, is kind of the, the classic super nerdy one because this is where you're actually modifying something which is happening um, on the system. And it's kind of more relevant to stuff which is in the field. You know, so it's like it's the device that you've got out there and people have got their hands on. They can put it in the lab and they start tampering with it. They start changing files. They start messing around with the memory. They can start pushing different things into the network. Um, quite often, it's quite hard to actually do anything bad that way. Usually, it's something much, much simpler. Usually, it's something that somebody's forgotten to secure somewhere else is where they break in. Um, repudiation um, is actually more of a business level problem, ultimately. So this is where you say, I didn't do that, that didn't happen. Um, and you have this question, like, well, how do you prove otherwise? Um, this only becomes a problem if you're like, you know, you're Amazon, and people say, well, I didn't buy that. <laughs> and suddenly you've got to always return some things. So um, the, the general solution to this is you, you log, log everything so that you can you know, very, very clearly show, well, if you didn't do this, why did you log on here and do this and do this and do this and do this? You have responsibility for these things happening. Um, so one of the other repudiation things, of course, is to attack the logs. So if somebody can get into your logs, they can start ripping stuff out and they can sort of start saying, oh, that never happened, this, I was never there, I didn't order that thing, I didn't trip that sensor, these sort of things. Um, information disclosure is the big one. Um, this is where stuff starts leaking out of your systems and people can then start identifying other people, use the data to attack other systems, um, or use it for you know, any number of criminal nefarious needs. Um, lots of ways things leak, usually the way you would least expect it. So kind of the obvious ones are is, is the databases, you know, misconfigured or uses default passwords, this sort of thing, you can just break into and get that sort of static data sitting there. Um, but there's lots more subtle ones. Um, classic one often is you just start hitting URLs on you know, with your web page and eventually you start getting errors back and if people haven't configured things correctly, that error will contain all the database tables or all the user credentials or these sorts of things. And there's an awful, awful lot of vulnerabilities around that. Um, the, the meal dishwasher one is a classic one because that basically gives you the password table um, if you traverse back up the directory far enough. Um, so there's all these sort of things. Um, and it's the least thing you expect because it's the most natural thing in the world to kind of say, oh, it'll, I'll give a, a useful, useful information in my error message because that's useful. And you know, it's useful for the wrong things also. Um, yeah, so we covered, yeah, data stores um, are particularly bad. Usually it's um, poor access, um, access credentials being set up. Um, a lot of these you know, um, database um, things we just install will have, you know, quite sensible systems for managing the access to them, but they're often too complicated and often have bad um, defaults. So it's very easy to set it up in a way which is not secure to someone who's more familiar with the technology than you are. Um, a classic one also is cryptography keys. Um, lots of people use cryptography keys or you know, special codes um, to protect various aspects of their system, and they just put them in a file there, unprotected. So then someone says, oh, I can't read what's going across the network. There's the key. I've just decrypted it now. Um, that happens all of the time. So it's a very, very easy thing to just fall over because you've thought about this part of the system but not that part of the system. Uh, denial of service is a favorite one. So you always hear about DDoS attacks. Um, we were talking about that at the beginning. And um, DDoS has become very, very fashionable in terms of it's like you get lots and lots of infected machines and you blast somebody's network interface and then they can't provide the service they're trying to provide. 
um, because of uh, you know there's just not enough space in the pipes. Um, however, um, before DDoS, there was always DOS, and there's lots and lots more nefarious kind of ones, and this will become increasingly important probably as firewalls get better and um, various networks get in place which can suppress DDoS kind of attacks. You get you know, a higher layer in the network stack, uh, and these tend to be more about complexity attacks. So these are attacks against processes or memory or data storage and these sort of things. So what you do is you find out um, basically a way to exploit a bug in a program which causes it to go into an infinite loop or causes it to kind of have to go and look up massive tables of data and therefore it slows down the whole system or in cloud times actually costs the company tons of money because suddenly it'll start scaling up and scaling up, scaling up. <laughs> suddenly your AWS bill is thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, personal favorite one, especially for IoT, has to be data store dial of service. So this is where you find some way of filling up the data store on a device in particular, which is probably quite limited, um, so that it has to basically die because it's got nowhere to put data anymore. Um, and then, you know, maybe it'll panic and reboot, and it can't boot because its data store's full, so it can't actually move anything around to create temporary files, and you've completely trashed the device. Um, that's surprisingly straightforward to do, even by accident. Um, not that I've ever done that. Um, and then finally um, is um, escalation of privilege. Um, basically, what you're doing here is um, getting inside a existing process which is um, running at perhaps a higher privilege level than, than um, you are as a user you're allowed access to, um, and then corrupting that in some way so that you can turn it to your own needs and then create a shell or something at a higher level of privilege and then use that to create another shell or another higher level of privilege using various exploits as you go. So this is like kind of the classic thing when people talk about buffer overflows and stuff like this. This is the sort of thing they're trying to do. They're trying to um, you know, start executing their own code in a different context and jump up the escalation. And as soon as you start jumping up, the privilege level gives you more and more access to more of the system. So even if you've done a great job in configuring all the layers of privilege in your system, it's all very well protected and partitioned. Someone starts leapfrogging up that, then you can't do anything, you just top over. Um, this is the sort of thing which even happens in you know, virtual machines and stuff. So you get people who pop all the way up from a process to an operating system to a virtual machine into another operating system to another process. Um, this is the big terrifying thing about cloud systems. So all that seems quite complicated and you know, even though it's kind of very um, um, fundamental about the sort of things you think about, it's often good to be able to get ideas about where you should be looking. Um, fortunately, there's um, these guys that OWASP Open Web Application Security Project and they've been going for a very, very long time. Have, does people know about OWASP stuff a lot of them? So um, they've been going for a very long time trying to secure the internet. And um, the sub-project has started, which is looking very much at IoT. And uh, what they regularly do is they forecast and they do an analysis of what threats are and emerging threats across the whole spectrum of internet stuff, and including IoT now. And there's a guy from Hewlett Packard uh, who's leading this project, and he's doing a very, very good job of trying to expand what was kind of a very server-side thing and make it more an Internet of Things thing and looking at the devices and the communication as well um, and doing the same kind of process. So um, I would definitely go and look at their, their wiki page. Very, very, very useful. Lots and lots of good ideas for testing your application, things to look out for when you're designing, all this sort of stuff. It's very, very nice. Um, one thing they produce um, is a top 10. Um, the last one was 2014. I think they're going to do another one this year, maybe. Um, and this is like a big survey of all the exploits that have been you know, reported to them. And they analyze them and they come up with a kind of a, like a weather forecast. So, you know, like you know, the, the weather warning forecast where, you know, as things get more and more red, as they get more likely and more severe. They do a similar thing for a top 10. They've only got top five here because of 10. <laughs> so, um, I mean, they can see the sort of stuff you'll see come up again and again and again in news reports about exploits. So um, insecure web interface, that's the typical one for webcams, is not the webcam itself, but the interface you use to configure it. When you buy one, you log on and you create an account and all that sort of stuff. They're not well put together, generally speaking, because it's IoT guys, not web interface guys doing it. So um, quite often they're leaky, all sorts of problems. You can get all sorts of control with that. Um, then very closely related is the second one is generally speaking, inefficient, inefficient, insufficient authorization. Um, so that's all interfaces facing the web, basically not enough 
protection to the APIs, particularly that these devices are using. Um, very, very common. What's often worse than those ones is that it's not so much that it's not protected, it's that it's protected badly. So you can see people have gone, oh yeah, we should do something about that, we'll just use this library. And they haven't quite used it right, or they haven't set it up correctly, or they've left the keys lying around somewhere, and it's very, very easy to exploit. Um, Insecure network server is very similar again, but it's kind of the opposite way around where you've got, rather than stuff you're using, stuff you're not using. Um, this is a big problem for a lot of you know, off-the-shelf operating systems. You're buying into a consumer piece of IoT. It's got everything open. So you know, you've got your um, EPOS actually, um, point of sale terminals are the worst for this, open uh, USB ports. So you can just like, stick a keylogger in. Hey. <laughs> Passwords. So there's all these sort of things. So um, that's mainly what that's referring to. Lack of transport encryption. If you don't use HTTPS, please get off the internet. Um, and then privacy concerns. Um, this is all to do with the database protection stuff, generally speaking. Um, so this is like, have you done your ACL properly? Have you locked down your database? Or most importantly, have you only collected the data that you absolutely, definitely, definitely need to provide that service? This is the biggest mistake that people make is they just sort of harvest all the stuff. Um, you don't need to. Just take the few things you need and what you do have anonymize as much as possible. Um, and then generally you'll get past that. That's possibly the trickiest one to do because it immediately bangs up against you know, business concerns because more data is better. Yeah. Right, so in conclusion, don't panic, but panic because you have quite a lot of stuff to look at and it's, you know, the, the, the Eurocrats are coming for you. So um, if you build this in to your whole design process at the beginning, it's a lot less painful. I mean, just ask, you know, take, take a day or two just to sort of go, okay, this is my system. Where, where are the vulnerabilities? What protections do I need? Do I need this many user rules or not? Can I collapse them in? Do we need this feature? These sort of things would make it a lot simpler. Um, and there's lots and lots of projects. OWASP is one of them. There's many, many other research efforts into monitoring this stuff. Um, actually, Department of Homeland Security have uh, industrial and IoT um, cyber protection detector directorate. And their, their site is brilliant, really good. So um, yeah, I'd go there, but you know, then they'll just follow you forever. <laughs> so yeah, but it's, good, it's, good, it's good tips. Okay, right, thank you. Um, there's some useful links. And also most of this stuff has been cribbed to one degree or from this guy's book. If you're interested in threat modeling and understanding, I would definitely recommend getting a hold of this. It's very good. Okay, any questions? Some ways has only got itself to blame for 
for allowing itself to be sandbagged <laughs> into, in, into yeah. this. The, the regulations themselves for GMP, the good management, manufacturing practice, you know, these are things like the FDA, which is what is that the European mm -hmm. They've allowed themselves to be sandbagged into the corner when they're doing this, and now, of course, they're being sandbagged by the, the, the I can't say people. <laughs> Oh, you can. It's okay. Well, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I, I know. I, We're used to I, it. I just find the whole thing, you know, absolutely important. And, and yeah. that's just one industry. In yeah, I mean, the you're right. I mean, and it's, I mean, the complexity of information systems in general is insane. And then when you put it in, into close proximity with other complex things like pharmaceuticals or, you know, medicine or any large scale industry like that, where lots of processes are important. Yeah, it's so, very few people will have the expertise in both sides. I think is, is, is the big problem. And there's just continual misunderstanding. And also the standardization process is not used to the, you know, the rate of change, yeah. particularly in a lot of traditional industries. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big problem and it will get worse. Okay, I think let's move on from there. Yeah. I would like to continue that debate during the panel uh, discussion. Um, but I think we need to move on to the next speaker. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. Yeah, Taylor is the CTO of uh, Critical Blue. Get tweeting, retweeting.
going to talk about um, software identity. So this is actually kind of one of the things that Barry was talking about. That's why Barry went first. So one of the kind of attacks that you can make against a system is like a, a spoofing attack. So what I'm going to talk about is a kind of a slightly more lower level nerdy detail. This particular aspect of uh, how you identify software and how that's much more important going forward and the types of attacks that you can make against systems if you, if you can't be sure what's talking to you. So one of the things that was happening over the last kind of few years is this kind of growth of, of APIs, web APIs. So, so essentially, this is the way that, that many systems communicate nowadays. You know, REST APIs, JSON data encoding, very, very common. There are many, there's this kind of enormous growth of APIs where uh, companies export the services directly through an API. They don't have a website so much anymore. They kind of see it as a kind of API first. This is the way you kind of provide um, service to your customers. And many mobile apps don't work standalone. Many mobile apps and indeed IoT systems are actually communicating with the internet via some kind of web-based API. Now with that, with that kind of comes the concern about, well, how do you secure these API systems? And you know, there, there are many kind of technologies and techniques around user authorization um, and authentication. Um, but the, the techniques around kind of authorizing the software entities that are talking to the internet are some, somewhat more primitive than that in general. So I'm going to kind of talk about this in the context of primarily in terms of mobile apps, but most of what I'm saying is very relevant to IoT as well. Um, a good example of this um, that happened you know, recently, uh, was very much in the news, is, is Pokemon Go. Um, so this was a kind of huge hit last summer. It was in the news all, all of last summer. You know, this, this game was released. Um, they, they tried to stagger the release over um, different territories just to, you know, to try it out and to, to kind of manage the amount of server load. Because essentially, this is, this is a game that has lots of kind of server interaction. It's, it's, it's truly interactive. There is a, there is a global map behind it um, you know, running, on, running on servers. Um, so they were trying to kind of release this gradually over, over a period of time. And it, it was a massive success, you know, half a billion downloads a huge number of miles walked, et cetera. Um, but one of the things that kind of emerged very quickly after the initial release of, of, um, of, of, of Pokemon Go app was that people were kind of downloading it in different territories, not the original territory they were targeting. They were kind of spoofing their um, GPS coordinates. Um, and there, then it kind of emerged this, this kind of game where people were actually trying to build in map features, because the game originally had some kind of primitive map feature um, that caused quite a lot of server load, and that was kind of removed in an update of, of in an early update of the app. And then what happened is that uh, people were actually building their own maps, um, and they became, became, became available on the web, so you could basically see a map of where all the Pokemon characters were, and that wasn't the original intention. Um, so what actually happened was that um, the, the, the Pokemon app and um, the backend server, um, they communicate via an API. Now that's not a public API, that wasn't something that uh, had been published. That was something that um, yeah, was private between uh, the app and the Niantic servers. So um, there was no information in the public domain about how that actually worked, but kind of within days of the app being released, um, people had analyzed what the app was doing and how it was communicating with the backend servers. Uh, there's basically a man in the middle attack, which I'm gonna talk about, where you basically analyze the traffic that's going from the app to, um, yeah, to the backend servers, and you work out what the protocol is from first principles, which means that then you can build uh, a software agent, an SDK, that communicates just like the app. And basically you can kind of then get the information that's available on the backend servers directly uh, and you know, in, this, in this particular case, you're kind of building up a, a kind of aggregate map of where the Pokemon characters were. And in, in, while doing that, also generating quite a lot of load on the, on the servers because you're making many more requests than the average app would. So you're actually increasing the load and therefore the cost um, you know, for, for kind of providing the service. So this wasn't the intention. Um, and then what emerged was this kind of um, cat and mouse game that kind of you know, occurred over weeks and months, really, where 
Um, initially, the app was, was easy to man in the middle, and then um, a new version of the app was released that kind of added some more protection to make that more difficult, but that was kind of immediately broken. Um, and then various other kind of protections were put into the, into the API to make it more difficult to build uh, another piece of software that could talk to the backend servers. But these things were broken within days, and it was, it was kind of this kind of ongoing battle that, that occurred where, where people were kind of, the enthusiasts were priding themselves really on how quickly, they you were know, kind of literally working 24 hours, they were priding themselves on how quickly they could work out how the app was making its request and basically breaking it you know, to, to re-enable these kind of map functionalities. And then it turned into legal threats, and there were kind of more restrictive mechanisms put in where there were kind of captures put into the app as well to kind of prove that you're a human rather than a, than a piece of software. Um, so this kind of goes back to the fact that, that actually, even though we have quite sophisticated mechanisms for user identity, in terms of a piece of software identifying itself to, to a server, it is really quite primitive. Um, in general. Um, typically, if you are kind of a, a user of an API and you want to sign up to use an API as a, as a software developer, you may have your own users that have kind of a, a user identity on top of that. But if you want to sign up and use, a, use an, an, an API that's on the web, you basically go to a portal and you, and you sign up and you get issued with an API key. And really, that is just, it's just a password. It's kind of it's, it's a random string of digits that get generated, and that's used to identify your piece of software when you talk to a back-end service. Um, now, of course, it's, it's just essentially, essentially a, a fixed password, and then you have to build it into your software application. And of course, because it's a fixed password, effectively, that's built into a software application, there is a risk. Um, and you, you normally, if you kind of read the small print when you sign up, it says things like, you know, be sensible with your, your, your API keys. Um, you know, don't publish them. Um, you know, make sure they're not, not easy to, to, to see or kind of extract from your software system. But the, but the reality is that you have to have that API key in your software in order in able to identify yourself. So, so at some level, it has to, it has to be there. Um, so there's kind of really um, two types of software that you need to worry about. There's kind of what I kind of consider to be a kind of piece, a private piece of software, which is something which is running on a server um, so it's kind of a server-to-server -server communication where you have the advantage that you're not actually releasing your software into the, into the wild. So, so you, your, your software is protected by your kind of not network security. So if your network security is good enough, then you, hopefully your software is going to be protected. However, you still need to be very careful because if you um, were to accidentally publish um, your, um, your software, then of course, then your your keys become visible, and there have been cases like this where you know people have uh, accidentally kind of published or you know, they've put their software on on GitHub and they've failed to scrub their keys out of their software, and immediately what's happened is that somebody has found that in in you know on on GitHub or some other kind of open source repository and and used those keys. And there's an example on the slide where somebody had made the mistake of putting their Amazon keys. Uh, they essentially published their Amazon keys and then literally you know, a day later they found they had this enormous Amazon bill because these were keys that basically allowed anyone to spin up various instances of machines. Um, and there are kind of software projects which actually kind of troll and analyze um, you know, the source code and actually look for things that look like keys and, can, and, and you'll be immediately alerted if a new key turns up. So there's a kind of an automated attack against that. But in general, that, that's less of a problem. The bigger, the bigger problem um, is really when you have to put your software into the public domain. So if you, you know, if publishing a mobile app, then essentially you're publishing your software to, into the public domain. I mean, it needs to run on people's devices and therefore it's in the public domain. It's very similar in IoT. There are kind of some, some uh, code reading protections on IoT devices, but in general, I mean, you're, you're putting your, your code into the wild. So if you want to keep your um, keys safe from, in this instance, I'm talking about a mobile app, there's kind of two attack surfaces you need to kind of worry about. There's the attack surface, which is where your API key is being transmitted from the mobile app to the, to the backend service in the cloud, so kind of in transit. And there is the attack surface where 
some, somehow the, the code is inside the, in the mobile app, so it's the kind of the, the attack surface where you analyze the mobile app itself. So talking about the kind of first attack surface, which is the kind of transmission attack first, and that was you know, essentially how this reverse engineering of Pokemon Go happened, at least initially. Um, I mean, the way, the way kind of TLS works is that you have various certificate authorities, uh, and they, they, they are trusted, and they issue certificates. And then you can basically, as, a, as an API provider, you can buy a certificate for your domain, and that gets signed by the certificate authority, which allows you to, you know, to demonstrate to an app that's connecting to it that you actually do own this domain, and you know, you, you are, it's been signed by this authority. And then on the other side, the kind of uh, root certificates um, are essentially pushed onto the device, and they kind of represent a set of um, certificate authorities which are trusted by that particular device. So if um, uh, you, you have um, a you know, device on the back end and th you know, neither of which are under attack, then basically TLS guarantees that the key negotiation that occurs when you start up the connection ensures that any man in the middle who's observing all the traffic can't know what the encryption key that's actually chosen for that session is and therefore can't see the traffic. So generally that's okay when you, when you kind of trust both ends of the communication. Um, the problem is that the situation we're in is not a situation necessarily where you trust both ends of the connection because generally if you're trying to analyze a mobile app or maybe even an, or an IoT device and try and extract some information from it, actually the one end of, of the communication is actually under control of the, the attacker as well. So if, if you want to man in the middle um, a, the communication between a mobile app and the backend server, you have the device, you have the, the, the phone or the tablet, then all you, what you can do is you can basically place you know, a, 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 a pro, what kind of man in the middle proxy, a piece of software that sits in the communication between the mobile app and, and the back end, um, and that basically issues a kind of self-signed certificate and says, yeah, yes, I am this thing from this particular API domain, trust me. And of course, normally that wouldn't work because you've signed the certificate yourself. It's not from a certificate authority because you don't actually own this domain. But all you need to do, essentially, in this scenario is you basically push that certificate onto the device and say, yes, this is, this is a trusted certificate authority. What happens then is that uh, you know, the, the mobile app will open that communication quite happily, thinking it's talking to the real back end. The communication will occur, but actually all the traffic is being decrypted in the middle, which enables you to see any, any secret or any key which is being passed across that, that channel. So if you have a particular uh, API key that's built inside the app, then you can immediately steal it at that point. Um, the way you kind of defend against that is that there's this kind of technique called um, certificate pinning which basically means that the app itself doesn't trust uh, what, what the, the, the certificates which are pushed onto the device. So it, it means essentially that the, the app itself only trusts a very, very specific certificate or particular certificate authority, uh, which means that you can't you know, do the man in the middle attack anymore. The problem of that is, of course, that the code to do that, to actually make that check, uh, is itself just a piece of code and another secret which you build inside the app. So all that does, it closes one attack surface, but the other attack surface of attacking the app is still essentially open. Um, now, if you look at kind of um, Android in particular, but, but also iOS, and I think in the future also um, IoT devices, there are many, many tools which enable you to take any app which has been published and basically look inside it and to reverse engineer it, to disassemble the code, do all sorts of kind of very fancy analysis that enables you to see what that particular app is doing. You can see that what's in the memory map. You, in many cases, you can actually um, modify the code on the fly, so you can actually make modifications to it. You can, you can debug it. Uh, you, can see, you can see what's going on, and therefore you can extract, generally you can extract the secrets from, from the app, which are the secrets which are used to access the back-end service um, or secrets which are used to kind of, kind of pin it to prevent man-in-the-middle attacks. And there are various tools that they enable you to kind of 
um, just break pinning, or they enable you to extract these secrets very easily. And then it's really a kind of, of, a, a kind of, it's down to how well you try and conceal the secrets inside the app. Ultimately, it's very difficult to win at this game, but, the, but you can actually conceal the secrets uh, in slightly more clever ways and kind of create them dynamically and you, know, you don't simply kind of put them as a string inside the, uh, the app uh, in order to extract it directly. But if you look at many, many apps, they actually just essentially just have the secret inside the app. It's very easy just by doing this kind of strings analysis to see those secrets. Um, and the reason why this is important is, is that the, the, it, be, it means that um, in any communication of a, of a mobile app to a back-end service, ser back service, the one of the attack surfaces that's not um, uh, looked at sufficiently really is this attack surface of the app itself. So I mean, if you look at kind of, you know, kind of a banking example, you've got you know, lots of security around the network of the bank itself. Um, and then there's the kind of um, transport layer HTTPS security between the mobile app and that backend API. So you, know, as you, you, know, you can't, as I was saying before, you can't simply kind of decrypt that traffic. And if you look on the kind of user side, there'll be all sorts of kind of uh, user authentication mechanisms, maybe biometrics, um, second factor authentication by text message, um, all sorts of um, technologies which are used to identify the user. The, the level of kind of um, protection inside the app itself is much less. And if you kind of look at kind of history of kind of online banking, many of the, the, the attacks against banking have in, in, the, in the kind of web area, web, web era where people have been using kind of browsers to do mobile banking, a lot of those attacks have been uh, viruses which have basically modified the browser and misrepresented what's going on inside the browser. So you might think you're kind of transferring money to person A, but in fact, behind the scenes, the, the, the app is actually modifying what's, what's being transmitted to the bank and you're actually transferring it to person B and being kind of tricked into authenticating that, authenticating that transfer. So if you can modify the app, um, then you basically control the complete presentation of what's going on to the user, and also you're controlling what commands are actually being sent to the backend API. So this is a kind of an important attack surface. Um, and it's not necessarily that difficult to kind of socially engineer someone into installing a, a modified banking app or installing some other app, which is actually a malware, which can then uh, kind of obtain root privilege on, on your mobile device and then modify another, another app. So th this is a kind of quite a concerning attack surface for all sorts of things, but yeah, yeah, obviously kind of something financial is definitely of high concern. Um, so there are some better approaches to kind of secure apps. Um, they're not widely enough adopted, um, but there is a kind of a, you know, increasing uh, move for, the, for these type for, for kind of particularly sensitive apps for these approaches to you know to, to be used inside. Um, they're kind of pure software approaches <clears throat> like white box cryptography, which essentially means that you uh, mathematically and code level obfuscate what's going on inside an app to make it much more difficult to work out how fixed keys are being used or what what keys are actually inside the app. Um, the difficulty with that is that um, it's sometimes possible to kind of lift the entire thing out. So, so even, though it's even though what's going on inside the, the computation is obscure, if you can actually lift, if you can take an app and you can lift the whole thing out and use it in your own modified app, then you might still be able to use that kind of cryptography without really understanding what's going on. So, so it kind of suffers from the fact it's quite, you know, it's, it's transportable. Another technology, which is, which is an excellent technology in terms of protection, are kind of, tr kind of trusted execution engines. So most hardware devices, pretty much every mobile phone um, and many IoT devices actually have a kind of secure area for execution where the code that's running in this kind of secure area is, is secured at a hardware level, which means that um, other software running on the system really can't observe what's going on. It's very secure. The difficulty with it is because it's so secure, it's also quite difficult to provision because you have to be sure that um, uh, that software that's being put into the kind of secure execution area 
is itself not malicious. You have to, there has to be a kind of, a, you know, kind of fully signed signature authority mechanism to actually provision that inside the device. And those mechanisms aren't as uh, well developed as, as you know, it, they really should be. And there's another area, which is the kind of area we're working in with mobile apps, which is what we kind of term software attestation, where basically rather than um, have a, a fixed key inside uh, a piece of software, you actually do a, a kind of dynamic measurement of the software, and you basically measure what the software is at a given point and uh, prove that it is actually the correct software and it's not been tampered in any way. Um, so this is obviously important for IoT as well. Um, I'm talking about this in kind of the context of mobile apps, but um, the IoT question is, is, is fundamental in the sense that if you have multiple um, sensors on the, on the edge of a network, and maybe they're, they're, those sensors are feeding back data, you know, gathering data or feeding back data via an API, how can you be sure that those are actually the sensors that are providing that data? How can you be sure that that data is real? If, if you can work out uh, what the protocol is and you can work out what keys or other mechanisms are used to, for those software entities to authenticate themselves, then you can basically spoof the data. And you know, there are many applications in traffic systems and medical applications where if you can spoof the data, then you can have quite devastating consequences. There are some really good technologies, especially in the IoT space, that kind of protect. Um, there are technologies which are kind of based on uh, uh, having a kind of private key and, a, and a, a certificate for each individual device that's kind of put there at the time the device is manufactured, um, which allows you to tell which particular device it is. And because it's a private key, uh, you, know, you, you, you don't know what that private key is, and therefore you can't spoof communication. <laughs> And it's done in such a way that it's got hardware support. So it's a bit like trusted execution engine. It's basically a kind of private area inside the hardware that you can't read back. So it's kind of provisioned at the time the you know, device is built and, and it's not easy to, 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 to then read back. Although it does imply that on the other side, you have to have a database of all these keys. So you then have to worry about, well, how are you sure that this database of all these keys is actually secure? Um, so yeah, so this is, so in, so in summary, I mean, basically, if you publish anything on an API on the internet, even if you didn't intend it to be, you have to basically consider that to be accessible to anyone. Um, and you have to consider the possibility that someone will reverse engineer the protocol and whatever mechanism you're using to authenticate. Um, and there is, there's much discussion about kind of user authentication and authorization and, and many techniques around it. but you have to draw the distinction between the user identity and software identity. Um, it may be that you have a completely valid user, but that valid user has been tricked into using a, police, a piece of malicious uh, software. Um, and you know, there are technologies emerging that are not widely used enough to actually kind of make these systems more secure. And I think this would kind of be a, in, increasingly, as we kind of secure other aspects of the internet, this kind of software identity issue will increasingly uh, become an area of, of, you know, of kind of hotter interest. Um, so I just want to kind of publicize our, our uh, Twitter handle, Crip Blue. So we kind of um, tweet about all things kind of security, um, IoT security, app security, um, and you know, everything to do with the kind of industry, especially kind of looking at the kind of uh, technology side of it. And we also have a blog uh, we just published another blog, blog article today which kind of is talking about IoT security and the relationship between IoT security and OAuth, which is one of the kind of standard technologies that's used for um, kind of user authentication. Okay, thanks very much. So, any questions? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, there are, it's not an area we currently deal in. We're looking at mobile apps and sort of higher end IoT systems. I know there is a lot of interesting work like the COAP um, protocol. There, there, there are a lot of interesting protocols which are kind of emerging to deal with kind of security with kind of lower end devices. Um, 
but, but yeah, I mean, certainly if you have limited compute performance and certainly with limited uh, yeah, tra yeah, bike transmission ability on those kind of low power radio networks, that, that's difficult because then you have to basically encompass your, your identity in a, in a way that is not visible to everyone in, in a small number of bytes. I have seen some approaches where you can spread out things like the key. So one of the issue you have with IoT in particular is a uh, lot of devices have a very, very good time of running this black key idea where this is never a visible software ever and the hardware acceleration is very efficient. So then yes, you can spread it out to the key because there's just multiple things and you can pull off the one So yeah, that kind of push all the way to Any other questions? This is the part of the evening. How are we doing for tonight? Now we can either do seats or sofa. <laughs> it's going to be quite cosy. So, Barry, Martin, do you think we can get four on that? What do you reckon? Okay, we're going to get a little bit cosy here. Take a seat because we're going to do the, uh, the Q&A thing. Um, I'll tell you what, I'll sit here. Go and sit, take a... Let's see, I should go and show you this. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably the uh, AV. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you want to um, watch that laptop over there? I mean, we, we, we need to bring it in, bring it in. Bring it in. Whose laptop is that? Uh, are we good? Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. All right, so... I try to process as much of that as possible. I'm not technical, firstly, disclaimer. Uh, secondly, I'm tweeting and I'm a guy, so I can't hold the cops. I wish I could. And it's actually a shame when I'm doing a lot of that online stuff. I find that you know, I'm missing portions of the talk and I often have to go back and you know, watch the, the live stream on YouTube later to get all these uh, insights and, and golden nuggets of uh, information. So. Um, I think let's talk about privacy and uh, I think privacy and security kind of do so often go ha hand in hand, don't they? But without getting too much into the GDPR conversation, because I think we could talk about that all day, it's more about um, I think that let's let's sort of discuss that balance between what is providing enough of a kind of a zone of tolerance in terms of security without really pissing off the end user. And this is uh, you know, something I think that, that needs to be resolved and, and how can we tackle that? How can we solve um, you know, this issue of, uh, there's, there's biometrics, so there's voice now, retina scanning, fingerprints. I mean, all that's, that's all very well and good for human to machine interfaces. But increasingly, we're talking about machine to machine. So there's no human interface built in at all. That's the biggest concern that I have when you've got machines uh, that are, 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 are managing some mission critical uh, tasks. Maybe they're, they're running a dark factory or an oil rig or a, a nuclear um, installation. And, and there are actually people are increasingly being taken out of the loop. How can you prevent those? those sort of spoof attacks and is that something that, that is, is a genuine concern? Are we worried about that? Let's talk about machine to machine security specifically relating to the, the AI and the, auto, the automation of, of mission critical assets. How about that? Um, I, well, touching on that, um, as well as what everybody's been speak, speaking about, are any of the speakers or any of here aware of joining uh, software that allows the user to join their own ID within the software. The reason I say that is, even though it's machine to machine, there has to be a human involved somewhere, perhaps a developer to start a top or whatever. So by the time you embed a personal ID, you know where attacks are coming from. 
not any mm. software that's doing that. It's not actually allowed by, by the user ID yeah. to go in, which allows tracing. And that's yeah. on the basis that when a user has put their own ID, and I don't mean an ID in a human form, but I do mean one that they use everywhere, um, people are less likely to um, try and embed systems mm. or start the attack services like or DDoS or the so What do you think? Yeah, you seem very keen to answer. Yeah, that. it's cool. I mean, the um, in terms of IoT, in terms of organizational leadership, but first of the corporate body, um, you know, increasingly a lot of devices will have this capability where you can kind of they'll be identify as that device from that developer and running this software specifically. Um, so you can kind of track it out to that degree, but usually that's not the problem, it's when the spoofing happens, so when you, you come up and pretend to be that device. Um, so that's the tricky bit, is, is being able to get that really repudiation where you can sort of say, no, that was you, and we can prove it was you for these reasons. That's very, very hard, because um, despite the fact there's lots of, um, you know, in theory there's lots of work around digital signatures, and you know, maybe even mapping the back by metrics and things, there's no standard, you know, you don't all have a barcode. So there's no uniform way of doing that. So in general case, you can't, particularly in terms of consumerism, you know, when you have a product and there's a billion of them out in the marketplace, you don't know any idea who's got it. And there's no way of saying who has it. Um, all the best you can do is to say, I know that that is a genuine device talking to my service. Um, and I know it's in its genuine condition not tampered with, therefore it shouldn't do anything bad. The only way to do something bad is someone's found a way to make it do something bad by putting stuff into it through legitimate channels. So that massively reduces the attack surface. Um, but I mean one of the things that's curious is you can never eliminate it without you know falling over into the you know the, the absolute knowledge kind of problem with privacy. You know, you, you can probably get an absolute secure system if you know absolutely everything. But then that's kind of terrifying. So there was, some, there was an interesting project from Google where it took a different approach to this where they used multi-factors in terms of authenticating, in this case it was user, you know, who, who was at the keyboard. I think it, Game it Cubs has um, their protection implications because you know, in terms of multi-factors it was like, you know, keystrokes, mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, patterns of behaviour, you know, moving the mouse. Uh, but the interesting aspect of it, it was um, the, the security level was variable. So depending on how confident it was <coughs> that you were the actual person logged in that machine, it would check, you know, remove privileges. So as, as you got <laughs> less confident, you know, you start removing oh, access yeah. to servers and things like that. Right. So yeah. I think that kind of multi-factor authentication mm. is an interesting approach. How it would be applied to IoT devices, um, I don't know, um, but uh, I, I thought it was an interesting way to look at it. Again, let's, let's project forward five, ten years. So we've got a certain percentage of uh, driverless cars. Um, our smart homes are running themselves, you know, the air con, the lighting, uh, the thermostat. Um, you know, should we be concerned about these these devices being hacked? Uh, again, going back to sort of mission critical civilian assets, so transportation systems, like I said, driverless cars, um, aircraft navigation systems, and as autonomy and AI starts to <coughs> become an increasing part of our everyday our everyday lives, um, again, what what can really should we just sort of take a step back? Are we being irresponsible by pushing forward um, all these technologies before we're actually ready to embrace them? If the technology is not being embedded at the heart of everything we do, um, is Elon Musk overstating the, the you know the concerns, the worries about AI and automation? Is it paranoia, or is it all fine and everyone's confident that it's heading in the right direction? Well, I mean, I think in terms of consumer devices, you know, as Barry was saying, it's it's pretty shocking. And unless there is kind of uh, much more oversight and, and required regulation, I'm not sure I see the situation getting bigger. I mean, 
Okay, let's, let's talk about, I mean, for yeah. example, kids' toys. Yeah. The amount of times we're hearing about kids' toys being hacked. Uh, not even hacked, just being shit with no security. And, uh, you know, that, that is really creepy. What can be done? Is it a gov governmental, you know, that you penalize the, the companies and then find them and there needs to be a kite mark on every product before it's shipped? I mean, there's already these mechanisms in place. I mean, you, you know, the rules about what can be in children's toys is the main reason why most children's toys are not suitable for under three, because it's so stringent. So, you know, this, 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 you know, this is already in place and you can just add to it. Yeah. The problem is the regulation is keeping all the technology. Guidelines like uh, a WASP or, I mean, the actual are these guidelines. companies so getting sued when they breach? Well, we've got guidelines. Okay. We've got regulators like the data commissioner. Right. We've got regulators, they're more than useless. <laughs> nine times out of 12. Because they've got no teeth or... Yeah. What's the problem? They just don't do it. People don't have the confidence to go to them. Um, when they do go to them, they are slow, they are reticent, they tend to be inscrutable, <coughs> and therefore not transparent towards um, ordinary people which circulates right back to the confidence. Um, so it's only the big organisations that tend to use them, unless you're somebody like Max Schrems, who's got a PhD in law, and is quite happy to take on Facebook. Mm. Um, but how about so class action lawsuits that, I mean, it's happening ah, against Fitbit, that's my but VTech in the States, I and mean, I think that allegedly they were one of the, the largest infringers when it comes to kids' toys. That's my uh, I think Mattel have also been implicated. Uh, have case. they been sued or no, or what? No. But I think the bigger problem is the fact that these, these, these companies who are not used to this technology, not used to the, these internet devices, not used to the fact that there needs to be the security. And they're, just, they're running in to try and get the next product out quick enough with these new tech, new ideas that are coming out and rather than screws the afterthought at the end of the day. But why don't they employ the right people in-house? Why don't they go to companies? Like like blue. Blue. I think that's the issue. Well, they don't realise the It's not rocket science. Okay, it's the expense. Yeah, so, right. so therefore, they're not going to do it because it's expensive, unless no, there's a very two, strong. There's two competing products, and one takes the extra time and expense to implement security. Right. The other, the other product got to market and has you know, paying customers beforehand. Okay. So unless you have something like regulation saying you can't take a, uh, you know, an exploitable product to market. Yeah. And. Or end user awareness. Yeah, it, well, the to un, say the that product that product is, is, is dangerous, more. don't buy it. You know, mum's yeah, yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. These these manufacturers yeah. will get a bad reputation. Okay, so it's either regulation that they they know something bad is going to happen if they ship uh, ship uh, irresponsibly, or their brand is going to be tainted because consumers are going to rebel. But right now, there's just a lack of awareness. Yeah, there's not, I mean, the market is not a good differentiator for this. Like, okay. like all, I mean, well, the success of Facebook. Um, people are very, very happy to just give all their information yeah. to everybody and, you know, large corporate <laughs> just and The regulators are always one step behind the scenes. Exactly, yes. Yeah. And, and, and so th that's the main problem. Yeah. So consumers aren't really concerned about their own privacy. Yeah, no, because, not because they don't really they don't understand it. They don't understand it. And the main I think, that's I, I think the main thing for data is anyone who's got a smart home or a smart car or a smart cat or a smart dog has certain things which give themselves away. Mm. So they somebody might say, Well, okay, anyone who's got a smart home likes Cadbury's chocolate buttons or, or something like that. And that data can be used to target advertising to these sort of people. And, and that's, that, that, that's, whether that's a worry or not is neither here nor there, but that's part of the So the average consumer has no concept of how their data is being yes. captured? It's quite low on the, on the, you know, okay. on the radar. Yeah. Of the thing. So that's something really, really bad is going to have to happen. And yes, before people like hate that, and it goes mainstream. Yeah, yeah. And, and if I just go back to that thing I was saying before, there are a huge population of children now who have not been vaccinated against measles because of what happened um, with that sort of thing. And there are going to be people with the long term uh, complications of measles which they have for the rest of their lives. You know, and be, because their mothers thought they would get autism by having this, this vaccine. 
people just do not understand this sort of thing. So how on earth are they going to understand the sort of very small things that affect us in our everyday lives? Okay. Do you, just what brand of chocolate buttons do you buy? Or, or something like that? That is actually the counter argument, because you know, I am saying that you know, people don't care about security and stuff. But actually, that's the counter argument. As soon as you start scare stories, so yes. everybody does care. Terror. So yes. it's maybe that's what we need to do. We you know, we're talking about that, you know, that car getting hacked in wide, remember? Yes. And there was a huge backlash to say, that's, that's total garbage. You know, the, the likelihood of a car actually getting remotely hacked is so you know, infinitesimally small that, uh, um, that actually, you know, was kind of a nipped in the bud. Mm. And, and, and in fact, what we need is more scare stories to generate more fear. Mm. Healthy paranoia, perhaps, mm. amongst consumers mm. to pressure the OEMs into embedding better security into their connected mm. devices. Real quick, sorry, I know that you were. But it's funny to say, you know, the, the thing like the big TK Maxx um, hack that happened a few years ago, there was a yeah. um, few big other big companies hack in the similar manner as credit cards and did their lost. And the share price went down for about a week and then went back up to the old Just bounced, yeah. As if, as if it didn't matter. And the yeah. people were shop, still shopping there as if it never happened. Yeah. Yeah. Because people don't, A, understand what's going on. Even if they did understand it, mm. it's not directly in front of them. It's not their information. So they, they don't know how, yeah. more what to do. So it's the boiling frog syndrome. So they just carry on. Yeah. It's it's so it's so so it's you've got one, one percent of population yeah. going, this is a problem, we need to deal with it. And the other problem is going, I don't understand it. Yeah. Or, is it, or is it just a case of like this is an accepted risk for modern society? Yeah. Yeah. Until it's too late. It's all things to worry about them right now. I mean, 300,000 yeah, people die every year in car Yes. Because what? Other things to worry about. Really, that's it. Really. So, that's it. The, the parallel earlier about uh, cars and car safety is thousands of people die on the roads every year. Yes, that's the point very often. But it took like a group of people, you know, like Ralph Nagus, it took somebody to kind of be a focal point to kind of change the law. Yeah. But then I mean said about, you know, kind of cost pressures, but companies like Volvo actually saw that as an opportunity. Yeah. And that's a sales point. Yeah. You know, if you want a safe car, buy a Volvo. And a lot of the technology that they pioneer mm -hmm. just they're standard on every car now. So I, I don't know, I think it's going to take a long time, but eventually it can kind of get into the public consciousness and then and then there's an opportunity to address it. But yeah, it's, I think yeah. yeah, lots of bad things are going to happen. It's, it's quite worrying as well that we seem to be going in reverse, where you know, yeah. in, in the States, you know, ISPs can now sell your, mm. your, yeah, yeah. Your, your, your internet history mm. and you have no, you know, other jumping on a VPN, you have no control over that. And so instead and of even if you are a VPN now, yeah, <laughs> yeah, instead of legislating against, they're, 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 they're permitting it. Um, so that's, I think, quite worrying. Well, uh, yeah. is that, that that applies to everybody else except the people in the states, isn't it? The, the, the states gather everybody else. No, that's that's right. respect. They can't do it in the state. This, 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 this is worse. Yes. This that's is worse. 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 So, so that, that's what that's bulk spying. So they've actually made it legal now for internet access companies through ISP to sell your internet history. Oh, yeah, this is commercial, yeah, it's not even, um, yeah, sort of uh, citizen security, you know, we're, we're getting beyond the snoopers charter or whatever it's called in the UK, so this is not keeping you safe, it's to make their money. But, but, um, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, if, well, is it more for governments? UK government, um, if you had kids toys that just burst into flames and scold their children, you'd have government all over it straight away. It'd be consumer protection pure and simple, so is there not a need for some sort of DSI type mark mm -hmm. on yeah. this connected company toy will not be sending pictures of your kids to Russian foreign makers or whatever it is, is there not a role government in that, and as a public service in society type of thing? Yeah, I think it's because it's, we're dealing with an intangible. Yeah. It's so difficult for the average person to get their head around, it's a little bit like mental illness. Sure. You know, a lot of people say that if you um, if you're involved in a car accident, you know your your boss, for example, conceded that you're physically you know beaten up. Yeah. Um, whereas if you are mentally beaten up, your boss may have you know little sympathy for you because you know where's the evidence? I don't understand where the problem is. 
So in the same way that, yeah, if something sets you on fire, you can physically see the burns. But what is the equivalent when your privacy is being breached? I suppose you could be compromised, blackmailed. And so there's, a, again, it's psychological damage as well as financial damage. But people can't really kind of relate to that in the same way. How do we solve that problem? Universal solving. My, my limited exposure to our learned friends is that you know, money is the only compensation. It's the universal solving. And, you know, someone breaks your life, you can't really break your fingers to give you lots of money. Perhaps, well, um, um, perhaps maybe you better than to which country. Let's not get it. We want to change the narrative. We now have these ethical hackers who are trying to make sure these systems are secure, trying to make it twice, reporting these to people. But is there not a disconnect between the people developing the products and the people who are saying they're the people the security issue? And there doesn't seem to be a connection between the two directly to deal with those issues as it were. Yeah. I mean it's to do with engagement, yeah. yeah. And yeah, and it's to do with different motivations. Because you know, if, if there's no you know, ultimately it's business trade off. So you're in business to make money, and you make money by selling things and you can develop them as fast as possible, new features into market, blah blah blah. There's no penalty for it not being secure. Why would it be secure? So do you think there might be a backlash where people suddenly think, okay, if it's, I mean, the smart TV spying scandal uh, that was exposed by WikiLeaks, um, it's a well-known um, South Korean consumer electronics, uh, electronics brand, where there are people now who are going to think, if I'm having an intimate moment or a particularly uh, controversial conversation, about my political views, for example, let's unplug all our connected engines. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I'm aware that I'm within, um, you know, uh, uh, listening, monitoring distance to Siri on my computer, okay, Google on my watch, and Alexa. So there's three different companies who are technically monitoring, but theoretically, everything I say. People are specifically buying devices to bug their homes. Yeah. So what yeah. are we, is there going to be a backlash where everyone starts going analog again? And then they go out and try and find that they can't actually buy a non-connected gadget and so they have yeah. to well, start they, going on eBay and stop buying factories <coughs> instead of eBay. What are sales for this for Alexa? Uh, high, high, yeah. very, very. I mean, there was an incident with Alexa yeah. just a few months back where a young girl, the parents had enabled one click buy on Amazon Alexa. So this little girl, about seven, eight year old, said, right, I want a doll's house. Alexa, buy me a doll's house. So it bought 140 quid doll's house. <laughs> well, that, they, that, that, that's that was the end of the story. That was because, because last live, yeah, right? Yeah, and then they broadcast it live on Fox News. And thousands and of people. A thousand houses. <laughs> 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 and and if you want to notice, he's got Alexa in, it, in the room. Have you noticed now that when someone says Alexa on the Amazon Alexa TV commercial, Alexa did light up and start responding. Now that there's some kind of over the air filter, oh, because yeah. I've noticed in TV spots, when they do talk, I uh, say Alexa, my Alexa is no longer responding. So they, they must have realized as a result of that, that, that there's some over the air block, analog, through the analog hole. I, I don't know how that, well, is it, there's, a company, there's a company called Chirp or something that does that. They can actually, they can embed cookies over the air from the microphone in your connected gadget to the TV ad that you're watching. Yeah, the yeah, idea of the ultrasonics is that yeah, for the last few years. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was kind of, kind of concerned that at one point that your Facebook might be listening to which TV ads you're, you're, you're listening to at a particular point and then we'll show you kind of appropriate content. <laughs> so, so do you remember Tim? For one week I did an experiment yeah. as I was paranoid that Facebook was monitoring because when you when you agree to the terms of the Facebook app, it has access to your microphone, your camera, your hard drive, and so on. So I didn't tell anyone what the brand was. It was just a random brand that I would never buy. But I started saying Harley Davidson to my phone several times a day for a week. <laughs> I started seeing Harley Davidson ads on my uh, newsfeed. And actually, I didn't. 
weirdly. I was convinced that I would, but I didn't. Spoiler in the lesson to the you were posting the message. But that is the counter argument. They're ahead of the game and they knew not to show me because otherwise they would have been posted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, this guy. Uh, don't, don't waste your money serving those ads. Show him, yeah, a charity shop ad or something. <laughs> so, uh, have we have we covered um, all the questions? Because I think we need to sort of uh, wind things up and have a little, a little bit more networking, a few more drinks. What's the hard stop? Nine o'clock. Because you guys need to go home at some point, I'd imagine. No particular Unless you sleep under your desk, yeah. perhaps you. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Hard, hard so we've got this much beer.